Okay, looks like we're live. Welcome to another live recording, a LinkedIn live recording or a Facebook live recording of the Nursing Home Podcast. The Nursing Home Podcast brings you the most relevant, up-to-date information that you won't find or that I haven't found anywhere else on the internet. We would like to bring you practical information that you can immediately implement to be a better operator, to be a better employee, better community member, and even a better um, regulatory compliance enforcer. Whatever it is, you have a much better idea of exactly how the inner workings work of the nursing home. On today's episode, I'm actually honored to have with me Richard Charlotte. Richard Charlotte is an equity partner of Fox Rothschild LLP. They're an employment He's an employment uh, litigator. I'm going to talk about some of the legalities and some of the more challenging relationships that can evolve and can grow and maybe sometimes faster between employees, employers, how to deal with it, how to avoid it, and how to best manage those risks. Richard, welcome to the Nursing Home Podcast. Shmuel, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've been watching some of the back episodes and I think that Joe Rogan better watch out. I think you're gaining that. <laughs> well, I, I surely appreciate that. Um, I will definitely let him know that. I'm happy that, uh, that you said that. So our listeners and our viewers can have a better idea of, of uh, who you are and how you got to doing what you're doing right now professionally. Before we jump into the weeds, can you give us just the short version of who is Richard Charlotte? Sure. I'm an employment litigator. As you mentioned, I'm currently a partner at Fox Rothschild. Um, You know, I I do a lot of work in the New York, New Jersey area, but have represented nursing homes, um, long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities all over the country. I started really as a general litigator, got more and more into employment litigation. And for whatever reason, because of contacts and relationships, um, one of my main industry focus is nursing homes, long-term care centers, et cetera. And I've had an opportunity to deal with a lot of different issues in a lot of different locations over the years. And, you know, been fortunate enough to gain a lot of experience, uh, which we can talk about a a little bit today. Um, I'm based in the New York office of Fox Rothschild. I practice extensively in New Jersey as well. And we have a whole team at Fox Rothschild that focuses on residential uh, healthcare. And we can talk about that later, but that's my, my basic background. Okay. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And that definitely helps us have a better understanding of exactly who you are and why you are the person in your company is uh, best equipped to really talk about this, uh, about this topic. Um, if you don't mind, I would, I would like, like we just mentioned before the show, maybe to share that anecdote just as kind of setting the stage, if you will. And I just never had the opportunity to share that story. Um, sure. Why start with an easy one? Go ahead. Exactly. So I'm going to tell you, this is a, this is a true story that happened uh, with me as an administrator in training. And I would love to hear your responses to, you know, what we should have done better uh, to avoid and maybe to manage this challenge. The short version of the story is that we had a, a CNE that was on a one-to-one watch for a resident, that at least we refer to as suicide watch. This resident actively tried very recently, uh, prior to this incident, to take his his or her life. And the res- the CNA's jo- only job was to watch this resident. I believe we had like two-hour shifts or four-hour shifts. You could go crazy from it. It's not the most stimulating job, but it's a very serious job. The CNA was found during the day sleeping on the job, which means directly wow. put this, re- this resident's uh, life at risk. Um, the administrator flew off the handle upon seeing this, and me being his his protege, you know, I'm, I'm his student, I'm learning from him. So he brought him into the conference room where we were discussing who knows what and yelled at him, scrammed at him, berated him, uh, really let it loose. And apparently that was supposed to be somewhat beneficial and then fired him on the spot, um, told him to get out of the building, don't ever come back, reached, um, tried to almost physically push him out of the building, reached over, grabbed his ID badge and then, um, yeah, and at that point, the you know the res the I'm sorry the staff member actually left at that point. I was found it strange at to put it mildly that that's the way to deal with this issue. Um, but as could be expected, the lawsuit came 
Uh, this was a person of color. So that was, I think, the main focus that it was discrimination. But really, even without that, it's probably a very strong case. And the facility was sued. I don't know the end of the story. I moved on to another building. Um, and this person, just to be clear, the, the administrator is a phenomenal administrator. I don't know the other you know, circumstances that could have led to this. But I'm curious to hear your take on such a story. Does this happen? Have you had other things that have happened? And the best way to manage uh, and reduce the risks for such events? Well, I've certainly encountered situations, maybe not to that extreme, where we had a suicide watch failure, um, but certainly where there have been altercations between employees resulting from certain employees failing to do things, or at least in the perception of the administrator failing to do things. And I think that you know, you almost have to go back to what could have been done or what might have been done before that whole episode happened when you're talking about training and preparing for situations like this. Because as I mentioned before, you know, everybody has their own pressures at, at their own job, not to minimize any of that. But at a nursing home, especially in a situation like that, um, you know, you have people working long shifts. You have people taking big responsibility with other people's lives. It's, there's a, an added pressure that goes along with that. And training people to be able to react properly, even under those circumstances, is a big part of litigation avoidance. I think it's notable also, you said that this was an exemplary administrator. So even mm -hmm. the best of us can fall prey to those sort of problems. So what you want to try to do in for something specific like that, and generally, is train people to deal with emergencies, have a protocol um, that sort of, you know, can diffuse the situation as mu much as possible. As humans, we understand the administrator's response a thousand percent, but what happens is you exacerbate a problem because of your reaction to it. And it sounds like that was pretty over the top. Now, I was gonna ask what the basis of the lawsuit was, and you mentioned that it was somebody in a protected class. So that makes some sense. and it Again, I'd be analyzing and we can get into litigation defense, which is another podcast, but mm -hmm. I want to know exactly what was said. Um, was it directed to the fact that somebody was, you know, a minority? Um, I heard maybe there was an assault at the end of that with the physical pushing. So, again, an understandable incident created by an exemplary employee can get out of control really fast. And what we try to do is get everybody on the same page, you know, when everything's going well, it's easy, right, to deal with the emergencies and the difficulties that can pop up unexpectedly. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, your training is going to include to de-escalate, speak to somebody else first, bounce it off somebody else first. I mean, clearly, that was a tremendous failure. And, you know, not knowing all the facts, but almost certainly a fireable offense for falling asleep on the job. Yeah, it but, was. Now you have two layers of problems because of the reaction. So that's what we got want it. To got it. I got it. Okay. The the lawsuit comes in again. I want to direct this to the areas that you you know that you would like to address as well. Um, at, lawsuits come in frequently. I know the first time I, I've seen you know p people have this perception that nursing homes are s sitting on big piles of cash, and if we could only figure out a way. Um, you know, to get that cash to our clients, then we're in a, we're in a good place. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, many times, it's nothing to be further from the truth. But there are many lawsuits um, that that are delivered to nursing homes. It could be from it could be a vendor, it could be an employee, it could be a past owner, it could be a neighbor. Um, I've seen a lot, unfortunately. So, and you know, the alarm bells used to go on, and they don't always go on. So the question is. Um, how I guess for let's talk specifically to uh, nursing home administrators and above, so regionals or nursing home owners. What is the best way uh, or a good way, good practice of avoidance? And again, there's so many different areas, so I don't know if there's one answer to that. But what can you give us for how to, in general, you know, if I'm a great operator and I'm still getting lawsuits all the time, and some of them could be completely frivolous, some of them could be somewhat serious. Um, like what's it maybe in general terms, a, a way of dealing with this? Well, look, anybody can file a complaint. That's number one. So you're right. There are all kinds of lawsuits and different gradations of seriousness of lawsuits. But let's talk about we're here to talk about from the employment perspective and what we can do with that. So, you know, I heard one of your episodes. I think his name was Izzy Wachnin uh, yep. talking about you know, it's a cleaning company. He did a very mm -hmm. good job. 
And he really talked about something fundamental is that you have to have your ears to the ground. You have to be meeting and knowing what's going on in, in your facilities um, informally as well. And that's really the foundational thing is to have your finger on the pulse and be proactive about your litigation avoidance. You've got to have regular training and you've got to have training by people who understand the issues and the problems that employees are going to face in nursing homes. You also have to have good policies and effective communication of those policies to your employees about how they behave, whether it's cell phone, whether it's treating residents, um, you know, whether it's, you know, wage and hour issues are a big issue with overtime and managing that. Um, and you have to have those things in place. One of the other things we often recommend, and again, every situation is different, is we have a lot of our clients in arbitration programs with arbitration agreements so that any dispute that might arise um, in the employment context from one of their employees would be handled in an arbitration. So as I'm, I'm sure you know, arbitration is essentially court by contract. You have a substantial amount of more control over the situation. It gets rid of some of the you know, unpredictability of litigation in court. You can pick your arbitration provider, whether it's the American Arbitration Association or out in California, Judicate West. There are a number of, of outfits that do it, input into how much discovery will go into it, into it. The forum, in, in which arbitrator you get some more control about the parameters, giving you predictability to deal with these disputes. There's also some other effects of arbitration agreements is that you can eliminate the threat of a jury. You can also, if you draft carefully under the right circumstances, eliminate or minimize the chance of a class or collective action and really have only have to face individual lawsuits one at a time. It can be a very powerful tool. The other thing that sort of an unwritten thing doesn't appear is that it's often a disincentive for plaintiff's lawyers to get involved. We do management side, right? So if you're a plaintiff's lawyer and you think you're in a jurisdiction where you're going to get in front of a jury with a juicy discrimination case, and then you find that your employee has signed, you know, a fair balanced arbitration agreement, and we can talk about how the employee's rights have to be protected in that too, um, it's not the same prospect in the litigation necessarily. So, you know, with that in place, you know, you've got, I won't call it an insurance policy. And by the way, EPLI insurance, employment practices, liability insurance is another important prophylactic thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these arbitration agreements, if drafted correctly, um, can be a very, very powerful tool because look, you know, you, we can talk about the cost of litigation and how much your average discrimination uh, case costs. And, you know, you can manage those costs as best you can. It's, it's a terrible drain on the resources, like you mentioned. But you know what's even worse that I find with our clients, the disruption, the time and the attention that you have to devote to pull you the, to litigation, to these problems that pull you away from doing the productive work you want to do, the manpower, um, you know, the, the time. Uh, it can be debilitating. Uh, and putting training policies arbitration agreements, getting proper insurance, it starts to take that weight off your mind as an owner, as an administrator, um, and can really, really help your business. So a couple of things. Um, first of all, thank you for that overview. That, uh, that definitely was extremely helpful. Um, to me, it sounds like, you know, there are, you can go to the dollar store and buy yourself a sign that says this property is protected by ABC alarm company and put it on your front lawn without properly installing an alarm system. And I'm not telling you if it's morally correct or not, but it certainly is effective because if there's 10 houses on the block and one of them has that sign, a thief will think twice before coming to your house. So if I understand correctly, if you have an, a, any really arbitration agreement, even if it's not done correctly, but if you have an attorney that has 10 employees coming to them trying to sue 10 different nursing homes and you and one of them has an arbitration agreement um, drafted and signed and ex fully executed, it would be less likely to, to go down that rabbit hole. Why should they, you know, if they can go down the other ones? Well, it, it, I mean, I, I think instinctually you're right. I think there, there's a trap door there, though, because if okay. you get a sophisticated plaintiff's attorney, and there are a lot of sophisticated, very good advocates for employ, employees and you know plaintiffs in this situation, 
if they see an arbitration agreement that has provisions that are oppressive or unenforceable, that, you know, based on case law and analysis that there's too much burden on the employee or there are other defects in the agreement, their first thing they're going to do is move to set aside the agreement and proceed in, in, in court. So now, not only do you have the threat of actual litigation again, you've got a proceeding before that, which puts in jeopardy all of your arbitration agreements. So I'm going to I'm going to say to you that you better have that alarm installed correctly and fairly for that employee or you may be buying another set of problems. Got it. Got it. OK. And th that's true. And th that applies equally to your house. The same thing that, you know, if you have a, a thief that has a little bit of experience and they've been to the dollar store, well, you know, they're the ones who create those. They sell the dollar store signs. Right. The, uh, yeah, 100 percent. Let's just be careful. I don't want to I don't want to be accused of, of uh, and I know you're not doing this, of uh, comparing plaintiff's attorneys to thieves. It's just the no. <laughs> See, that's the attorney and you coming out. I wasn't even thinking of I have the a whole file. Is out. The attorney is out. It's, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't I wasn't even pulling out all my lawyer jokes and we have enough lawyers in the family for we can we can have a whole episode just on that. Uh, but, too, sure. um, OK, but the point is having this uh, properly executed can be a protection. Um, obviously, having it done properly is the best way uh, to do that. Now, you mentioned a couple of times about training. Um, what type of training are you referring to specifically? I know that. In the I'll just explain my question is that in the nursing home setting, many times we're sick and tired of hearing about training because everything requires a training. And sometimes the training just means someone drones on for X amount of time, hands out a sign-in sheet, and the training really accomplishes that we can document that now you know this piece of information as opposed to actually being properly trained um, on that piece of information. So what type of training are you talking about? Um, and how is it best done, and what does it accomplish? Well, I, I'll, get, I'll give you two examples. You have to have anti-harassment training. You have to, you know, again, you're having a lot of people, sometimes in a small space under pressured circumstances, interacting. And you have people from different backgrounds, different cultures, and not everybody is sensitive to what they need to be sensitive to. So there's the initial explaining to people that this is not your living room right? There's a way to conduct yourself in the workplace. You can mm -hmm. be nice and be cordial and everything, but there are, there are lines. You draw bright lines for people about behavior that's unacceptable. And you've got to review that periodically. I feel that doing, you know, it's harder in these days of COVID, but doing it in person and having a trainer with a personality that brings it more alive so there's no droning is another very important piece of it because you're right. It's like receiving emails. It's just blah, blah, blah you know, your eyes so, glaze over and and we work very hard to avoid that and there are ways to do that and there are tools to do that visuals etc role playing etc um, so anti harassment training is absolutely critical and that people should understand sort of back to your analogy to your uh, hypothetical that if something goes wrong and they see a harassment a harassment incident or they're harassed that there's a chain of command there's a way to report it there is a built-in process within the home or within the company that th those grievances can be redressed. Absolutely critical because one of the worst things you can do is have a problem and let it fester or let it go outside the channels of the nursing home before you have an opportunity to deal with it. Um, you know, certain size companies with arbitration programs will also have a a pre-stage of some sort of mediation and sometimes it's peer review, sometimes it's a third party where you would go and speak to a third party and not have it binding where arbitration would be, but, mm -hmm. you know, and solve the problem on a settled basis before that. But you need to have the problem identified. You need to have the problem reported. Um, I think that's important. I think people also need to be trained very carefully on clocking in and out and you have to have the right system and people need to understand that, you know, clear training on when overtime is appropriate, when it's authorized, when it's not what an emergency is, because you can run into wage and hour problems um, accidentally. And, I, you know, I don't want to say that, but inadvertently, because there are mm -hmm. things that are going on that may not have been reported. People may not, not have been conducting themselves properly. So, again, got to have effective trainers. You got to do it frequently enough, but, again, not too frequently and find that balance. Those are two areas where 
you can, it can make a big difference for your for your nursing home business. Got it, got it. So uh, we basically cannot have any attorneys doing the training because you said you want it to be engaging. Uh, well, I won't, <laughs> I, won't, I won't take that personally. I mean, I, I'm not sure if I would have, uh, you know, a tax lawyer do it. Sorry for all the tax lawyers out there. But I think we can find some people who are on their feet and can present well and uh, and make it come alive. I think we can okay. find them. All right. That's, even that's, even if there are attorneys, I just, I just had to say that. Okay, you you just reminded me that we have I have this opportunity of you know digging into attorneys, which I don't think I've had before in the podcast. So bring it on. I pre- okay. <laughs> I've got alligator skin; it won't bother me at all. Exactly. Um, what is so, so? I understand the importance of the training, and what you mentioned before is something that um, you know I've shared I think before on the podcast, and for sure off of the podcast that a nursing home and other public healthcare settings are like. A, a, a micro version of the world that goes on around us and people are forced to interact in ways that we wouldn't necessarily if we met each other in the supermarket we wouldn't ha- we you know we wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to even know some of the sensitivities of other people's cultures of the places where they come from some things might be mortally offensive in one culture and be completely commonplace casual maybe even complimentary in, in another Correct. Um, in another culture, and it may depend on who's the one who's saying it, how it's said, uh, you know, voice inflection. It, there are so many variables, and they can seem so subtle and perhaps even irrational or silly, illogical to someone who's not part of that culture. And frankly, it doesn't matter. Or, all right, you, you'll tell me the legalities, maybe of how much matters, how much doesn't matter. But the point is, it's a, a it's a micro version of people who never see each other. Are walking by the rooms where they live, the the rooms where they sleep, the rooms where they engage with each other and they socialize, um, the other public spaces, which are very um, they're they're restri- restrictive to some extent, and it has its own little you know rules within the facility, and it definitely invites um, this invites room on the positive side for positive engagement and all sorts of wonderful sure. outcomes that happen in healthcare settings, not just physical, emotional, spiritual. Um, and others, but also it leads to all these challenges as well. Um, yeah, and that's, I guess, and that's where, you know, on a serious note, that's where the training uh, really does come in. And uh, But in order for this to be successful, it has to come with leadership endorsement and not, here's a guy who corporate said we have to have, so we're going to give lunch, and when he's done, get back to work. It has to be, you know, it has to be blessed. My, from my, leadership. My, my, my clients who are most successful dealing with these issues are in the training room when I'm doing the training and it, uh, to, to, uh, to a person, that's the case. And, you know, it also goes hand in hand with good written policies. Also, what's really important is that people understand where the lines are. You're not ultimately going to be able to control human behavior, but you can put people on notice of what's okay and what's not okay. And you can do that in an effective way. And if you have people operating in good faith, really trying to take care of people the best they can, by and large, you're going to be able to avoid a lot of problems, or if the problems arise, deal with them in a contained way where, you know, everybody's working in the best interest of the mutual goal. And, you know, that sounds like pie in the sky, but I've seen it, you know, over almost 25 years of doing, you know, management side employment litigation. It can make a big difference to take that, you know, attitude that I don't want this karma in my building. I want, I want everybody trying to row in the same direction. And it can make a big difference when people know what's expected of them very clearly. And, and sometimes there are language barriers, like you say, and there are cultural barriers, and you need to be sensitive to them as an employee. I mean, if, if there needs to be training in another language, we provide training in another language. That it, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, you've got to tailor it to your workforce. You've got to know your workforce um, and give them a chance to get it right by letting them know what's expected of them. That's really, I think, the underlying theme. You're right. I mean, uh, just to talk to your point of policies, um, policies in a folder on a desktop or in a binder that's under somebody's coffee doesn't really do anything. And, ha- you know, policies are important, but if they just stay in the book and in, again, people sign off on it, it doesn't matter. But people have to get used to actually referring to them and knowing what's there. Um, I know that that's a big challenge, but that's the only way it could really be effective. It's a huge challenge. And, the, you know, the employee pol- uh, employee handbooks and, the, you know, the best practices policies that we do, you know, seem to get bigger and bigger every year with what you have to worry about. So it's mm-hmm. an important part of the training also to pull out 
some of the really, really primarily important ones. Obviously, the employee is going to be responsible for knowing everything. Um, and there is going to be a sign off. There is going to be a sheet that they've signed and, they, and they've read and they're going to be expected to know it. But you're right. In real life, if you really want that policy to work and come alive, you're going to have to demonstrate and prioritize for them so that they know where the lines are and what's what's really important. And, you know, again, no system is perfect. There's never going to be perfect execution, but good communication and everybody operating in good faith um, goes a long way, really goes a long way to eliminating mm -hmm. problems and dealing with them before they turn into litigation. Amazing, amazing. Um, as far as um, arbitration is concerned, just going back to that for a moment, sure. um, there's... Uh, you spoke about the advantages of having a properly executed arbitration agreement between the employees and the employers. Uh, are there any downsides of setting up such an arrangement? So, so there can be. That's it's a very good question. There can be, and it, you really have to. And this is why nothing in what we do, and what I do as as somebody who litigates and understands litigation avoidance from that, is that there's nothing that's a boilerplate or template. You have to look at each situation individually. So there will be some times where you won't necessarily benefit from having limited discovery. Okay. You won't necessarily benefit from not being able to appeal, which is something that is often put in, you know, in arbitration, there's not going to be an appeal um, mm -hmm. unless you actively put that in. By the way, another thing about arbitration agreements, which is important, I want to mention is that they're confidential, but only if you draft them to be confidential. They can be confidential, and that can also cut both ways. So you've got mm -hmm. to think about that. Um, and, you know, it gives you some predictability, but it puts some limitations uh, on you also. Um, so th those are some of them. I think by and large, you know, I've come to learn that they um, help. I think they certainly help employers. I think they can often help employees. And I think it's very important that employers understand they're going to be paying in almost every circumstance the cost of the arbitrator, um, not necessarily the attorney's fees of the employee, although that can be, you know, drafted in under certain circumstances that might happen also. Um, so there's mm -hmm. going to be that cost. Typically, not to get into the weeds too much, typically you're not going to want an employee under an arbitration agreement to bear any costs that they wouldn't otherwise bear in a regular court proceeding. So, you know, sort of keep, keep it basically six of one, half a dozen of the other from a cost perspective for the employee makes it something the courts are going to look at as a fair agreement. But um, so there are some additional costs, potentially, if you're paying the arbitrator. Sometimes you wish you had, you know, contracted for more depositions or depositions at all. You know, not every case is the same. There may be a lot of witnesses. There may not be. There may be good documentation. There may not be good documentation. Um, which is another very important practice to engage in to make sure your documentation is, is up to snuff in the event something goes wrong in terms of something, you know, proactive to do to, to avoid or mitigate litigation. Um, so th those are some of the downsides. Got it. Got it. Okay. So we could get really in the weeds here, but I think that would be beyond the scope of today's conversation to talk about the specifics of, you know, what could be included, what can't be included um, just going to documentation for a moment, uh, many times there, there is this elusive, uh, mysterious, mystical, elusive department in every nursing home called the HR department. Uh, many times the HR department really doesn't exist. If we want to call a spade a spade, the HR department is the scheduler. The HR department is the business office manager. The HR department might be the director of nurses if she wants to wear that hat or he wants to wear that hat that day. And when there's a conversation that has to happen in a perfect world, right, you're going to have the department head, the employee that we're dis dealing with and whoever's from HR having that conversation. Um, I, I would venture to say that that's usually not the case or many times that's not the case. And what you're talking about is a well-documented -doc conversation and referring back to it two years later through just the papers and understanding what actually took place. Um, Many times, you know, that, that may, it may not be very well documented. So can you give us just a couple of best practices uh, for nursing homes from the employer standpoint of how to, without hiring another person, without, without going crazy, just based on what they're already doing, um, what can they do today if they want to implement? Is risk avoidance, and all, the truth be told, and I'm sure you know this, 
the employers forget. They don't even know exactly what happened. You come back two years later and you want to open up a can of worms. They don't know. So can you give us a couple of best practices um, that employers can do for this? I, I, I know they do because they turn into litigation, litigations I defend that, you know, that's for sure. Look, you said something that I want to talk about for a minute where you said, you know, not to make them crazy. You don't want to put so much. I hear from younger companies this a lot. I have to worry about that happening. You know, I trust my people, um, which are all perfect sentiments, but don't execute in real life, you know, w- with enough certainty. So I think if you're not going to set up a designated HR person, that's their full-time job. First of all, you should have a sharing of responsibilities among different people. And you have to pick the right type of people. You have to find people who are able to deal with pressurized situations in a calm way. People who do have a vocabulary where they can communicate with different you know, cultures, different languages, different attitudes in a way that doesn't make the problem worse. I think that's mm-hmm. very important. I think the most important thing you can do, and it's going to be dependent upon everybody's home and everybody, everybody's nursing home and everybody's business, is eliminate as much friction as you can from incident to papering. Mm-hmm. So whether it's having the forms, you know, out the right way, you know, available quickly, easy to fill out, quick, you know, in, in other words, user friendly, that can be very, very important because if it becomes a hassle to fill out the report or it becomes a hassle to go file the report, you know, if you're not going to invest in as much in the human capital in the HR department, invest in the tools that will help you, you know, make it easier for the people who are doing, you know, juggling, juggling jobs and removing friction. That's going to be different for different people. Um, You know, you may want an electronic system that helps you, um, you know, report everything, you know, in, 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 in daycare centers, they have that in the room. There's, there's all kinds of related technology. And I work, we work with a lot of clients with technology. That's another Mm -hmm. um, that that's very useful um, nursing homes to deal with these kinds of things and resident issues in addition to employment issues, but remove friction, um, make a concerted effort to find the right people. And again, there has to be checking in with those people. Like, as he said, you know, you have to have your ear, ears to the ground um, and know what's going on to be able to head off problems. It's gotta be a team effort. Well, well, that's, that's actually, that's very, very, very helpful. Um, because, you know, sometimes they share responsibility, so nobody owns it. Uh, but then the day we can split it up so that each person owns a different piece. And your other point also is spot on because where is that HR form and looking through drawers and binders and policies and uh, that's going to make people not want to do it. But if it's very easy to print it out or if you don't even need to print it out at all or and something like that, and it's, or if you even the even the best way, if you can just you know document it on your phone or document it on a computer in a very easy way that we're already used to you know documenting other pieces of information, uh, that's definitely very helpful. We, we, we have a lot of suggestions to make in that area. Let me give you one concrete example with arbitration. Sure. Agreement. We want employees to sign off on the arbitration agreement. Can't tell you how many times it's more than on one hand. I've gotten a lawsuit from a plaintiff's attorney in court. And I say, wait a minute, I know they have an arbitration agreement. So I'm going to knock this out of court and I'm going to compel them, you know, dismiss and move to dismiss and compel arbitration or move to stay. That's another litigation tactic. But in any event, and I go back to the client as they send me the signed arbitration agreement. Never signed. Silence. Or can't find it. And I've had situations where it ultimately was found. And I've had situations where it wasn't found. Now, it may be annoying at the time, right, to keep track of all these agreements. But let me give you an idea of removing friction. We, we, we try to get the employees to sign the agreements around the time we're doing other things with the employees, whether it's a training, right, or revamping the handbook and having them sign off on on reviewing the handbook you try to cluster things so that you know it's a time when you're documenting so it can be included in that so it's not one time here one time there again minimize the events that might cause a paper to get lost or a document to get misplaced got it um do you do electronic signatures is that valid um yeah you can you can have it you have to have a system that's correct but yes you can have things signed Mm -hmm. electronically yeah Right. I mean, because that could, you know, tap, tap, tap to sign. Uh, sure. You know, I, you know, I think you want to be documented. They understand what they're doing. Yeah. I, you know, I've had cases with that where, you know, the argument was made, well, they didn't know that this was a document in the system. 
there are sophisticated systems now that make it abundantly clear to everybody what you're signing. You just want to make sure you have one of those and that there's no ambiguity that somebody can say they signed off on something they were unaware of. That, that may not carry the day, but it's going to cause you problems. Got it. Got it. Well, this is oh, fascinating. Um, I see that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, this is really, really fascinating. Um, I just I'm just noticing the time blew away. Um, any final thoughts regarding arbitration um, as we wrap up this um, episode? Uh, something that operators can take and maybe implement right away. Something um, in regards to avoiding litigation and, and managing these employee you know, compliance. Look, I, I think the maybe the most attractive thing I can tell people listening out there is that these are not really expensive to implement. You know, you're not talking about major costs to put these protections in place that will save you major costs. And it's worth um, considering them, understanding how they could best be tailored to your business and exploring the option, at least exploring the option. Um, because if there's something out there and you may want one piece of the things we're talking about and not others, or you may feel you have enough, uh, you know, protection in this area, but it's not something that people should feel or, you know, employers should feel is daunting to get involved in or get, at least get informed about. Uh, and it can bring a lot of value very, very cost effectively. Mm -hmm. What about towards the sentiment that you mentioned earlier from younger companies that say, oh, this is not going to happen to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any way of quantifying how frequently it actually does happen? I, I wouldn't have a job if it didn't happen. I mean, th th this, you know, th there, there's litigations out there and things happen. And it's, you know, people should understand just like in real life, you can't anticipate everything that's going to happen. And believe me, I understand it. There are tremendous co costs associated with, you know, in the nursing home business or starting any business. I get it. But, you know, you have to think of it as some sort of like a, a business health and life insurance policy. Because you get the actual insurance, which you should get also. But it's really, you never want to have to use it. But if you mm -hmm. need it, you want it to be there. And that's, right. I think that mindset, you know, if, if younger companies can get around that mindset sooner and take some of the pain, and that's why I say it's not really tremendous pain. It's really very cost effective. They're going to save themselves, you know, the real pain of litigation in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, amazing, amazing. Well, we want them. We want them to, you know, with all insurances, we want to waste the money for insurance every single month, right? Because we'd rather pay money for car insurance and never get into car accidents, pay money for life insurance to live out long, healthy lives, and pay for whatever litigate, you know, whatever uh, costs there might be for setting up these agreements and never have to use them. You have to think about it as an investment. I've seen it over the years that it's a tremendous investment. Um, and something that's ultimately going to benefit your business tremendously. Amazing. Um, Richard, it's been amazing having you on the Nursing Home Podcast, and I really appreciate you taking some time um, from your schedule to be with us today and just share with us a little bit of the information and some of your experience in this industry. And I would definitely look forward to continuing the conversation maybe at a later date um, in this forum or other forums. If our listeners or if our viewers want to learn more about some of the work that you're doing, um, and they want to learn, you know, continue the conversation with you. How's the, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, first of all, let me say it was a thorough pleasure. I really enjoyed this very much, and I look forward to doing it again. There are all kinds of topics we can talk about on the camera, off camera. It's been a pleasure working with you on this. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You see the spelling of my last name is exactly how you would not spell Charlotte, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's Charlotte. Um, I'm at the firm of Fox Rothschild. If people are taking down my email, it's R-S-C-H-A-R-L-A-T at foxrothschild.com. Um, I'm available whenever anybody wants to chat. Don't think you're always on the clock to have a phone yeah. call with me. I don't want people to feel that way. To spell another myth about lawyers, if I might, before I, uh, I'm, off the sh I'm off the podcast. But uh, I'm happy to help anybody as, as much as I can. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you again, Shmuel. This is really great. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much for coming on. And we'll definitely put a link to you know all the contact information on your website in the show notes.